welcome back to the fourth part in this series where I see if I can beat the Final Fantasy XII Zodiac Challenge. This is a challenge run series where each character's class is determined by their actual Zodiac sign. And if you have missed the first three parts of this video, I highly recommend you go back and check them out by clicking the link on the screen or in the description. On the last episode, we had just arrived at Mount Berhomises before killing our biggest rival yet, the Gill Snapper. And we're going to continue that trend of doing some hunts by heading to the waterway that we started the game in and as you can see here the enemies have gotten a lot tougher we have these Marlboro which are dealing a lot of damage and status effects and have very large health pools I, uh, I think we're probably a little bit too under leveled to be in this area but there are some hunts here that I want to complete while we are still under leveled just to see how strong our party are so now that we have successfully defeated the Marlboro it's time to move on to the first hunt which is against this tiny little jelly boy and there seems to be quite a lot of jelly boys in this waterway we fought one at the beginning of the game we're fighting one now and then we have one straight after this battle so something about the water and the sewage just attracts jelly maybe this is like a manifestation of everybody's poop from Rabanasta turning into like giant jelly monsters disgusting but regardless if you know anything about the final fantasy games you know that jellies are often weak to magical spells so we have Fran and Bosch of course dealing black magic spells as a way to pierce their thick armor thick and juicy bags, ah! stabbing a sword through jelly obviously wouldn't do much it would just get stuck right so you need to burn the jelly burn all the poo out of the jelly until he eventually dies and yeah. this one is actually quite an easy fight he does manage to KO us and uh, few times and deals a significant amount of damage but it's nothing too challenging the status effects that it causes are slow and poison and I'm not really too worried about slow and poison poison is probably one of the weakest status effects of this game simply because the damage it deals isn't too significant and doesn't happen often enough that you would even really notice it you know the the main bulk of damage is going to be from the enemy itself so the little chip damage that poison does doesn't really bother us hence why I'm not really bothering to cure it off I just rather heal our HP as that is all that really matters and we go absolutely hunt crazy in this episode so I am going to skip forward to us defeating him he did manage to KO quite a few of our party members along the way but we honestly did this one without too much of a challenge now let's move on to the next jelly who is an even bigger jelly than the last jelly and this jelly happens to be scared of boys so you have to go in with a party of females only so we have Fran, Ash and Penelo as our party members don't mind Larsa he's just there <laughs> you can't remove your guest from the party and the jelly doesn't seem to mind maybe because Larsa's prepubescent he can't tell that he's a man I don't even know why this jelly is scared of men in the first place but as soon as you have an option to move in one of your male party members he won't run away he will continue the fight you just can't enter the fight with a man in your party does that make sense no it doesn't <laughs> so as previously mentioned jellies are super weak to magical spells and we had Fran who was dealing black magic damage but I needed to get Varn out to heal us and I should have really swapped into Bosch because Bosch can deal magical damage and heal us by sending Varn because he just has a higher healing potential but that means we now have a party of three characters that cannot deal magical damage towards him so we're chipping away at his health very very slowly and he always seems to target every single one of our characters when he attacks and also Van is using Cura which targets all of us so there are just no windows for us to swap in to another character we do get a few minor windows here and there but I miss every single opportunity <laughs> until later on in the fight it's just uh you're focusing on the fight and what's happening on the screen but you also have to look at the bottom right to see when our name has gone from red to blue so that we can swap characters and the window is so small and I just keep missing it every single time. Uh, luckily he's not doing too much damage to us. He's caused sap and blind on us which is like annoying but not too difficult to deal with. Luckily Varn has blinder. The slow is a little bit frustrating but it's not going to kill us. It's just going to mean the fight is a little bit slower and that's okay. 
The sap, on the other hand, can be cured with regen, but I just don't really bother because, again, it's similar to poison. It's just not really dealing enough damage to us for us to be worried about it. And I want to save Varn's MP for spells like Cura and Blinder because they're just a bit more important. I'm just going through and seeing if we have any magical techniques we can use. Varn has Drain, which is pretty good, but again, I don't want to waste his MP because it's so vital that he cures. Luckily, our physical attacks aren't doing as terrible as I thought they were. Varn is obviously our weakest of the bunch, but Pinello is dealing some surprisingly good amounts of damage, as well as Ash as well, doing some nice damage. Ash does unfortunately die, but I was about to revive her and then I thought, hang on a minute, this is a perfect time to swap into Bosch. So we leave Ash's corpse in the reserve and send Bosch in to deal some fire damage. And you can see there, it's dealing almost 2000 damage, which is so much better than all of our physical attacks. So now that we have Bosch, I'm feeling much more comfortable that we can kill him. And I'd like to get Fran out, but again, we're just not having the opportunity. And Pinello's defenses are pretty good, so it's quite unlikely that she's going to die, which is annoying because we want Pinello to die. Not a joke, just a fact. Not in a horrible way, it's just so that we can swap in to Fran. Van does unfortunately fall, and I thought I could send in Fran now, but having two white mages is probably quite important, as he is about to get into HP critical mode, which he does right now, and this is when he starts dishing out big damage. So Bosch goes down, but we need Bosch because of his utility, and I feel like as his health is getting pretty low, we're probably going to be just fine. But it just takes a long time to get this last chunk down. It looks like his health is empty, but it isn't. He still has a surprisingly large chunk. And after Van goes down for the second time, I'm like, right, now it's time to send Fran in and just get the job done. We just need both of them to be dealing some damage to him. And of course, instead of just manually selecting to revive Fran, I let him automatically cast rays on Pinello which is unfortunate because Pinello is not doing enough. And then he automatically revives Larsa. And my dumb dumb brain watching this back is like, why did I not just select it? I was probably pretty tired when I filmed this bit of footage. It was getting towards the end of a session and I'd been recording for like three, four hours. And oftentimes when that happens, the gameplay suffers because my brain just can't seem to do anything. When I start off each session, I'm really thinking about every battle and I'm doing super good and I'm using tactic and spells. And then like when I'm getting towards the end, I'm like, I just want it to die. And uh, seeing how low his health was, I didn't think I would need to do anything, but <laughs> this last bit takes way longer than it needs to. But we do eventually get him down and definitely a lot harder than the first jelly, but nothing my strong ass party cannot handle. But now let's continue on with the story. And I just want to take a moment to appreciate how gorgeous this game is. Like every environment is just so lovely. Like look at this place. We're on top of a giant mountain with floating sky palaces and things everywhere. And I really think the world of Ivalice is just so magical and cool to look at. And Mount Bert Omises is definitely a highlight for me. Is he sleeping? No, my child. Whoa. I do not sleep. I dream. I dream? So Ash is in the middle of getting this guy's blessing to become queen and he recognises that she wants peace amongst the land so he's happy to give it to her and they're trying to seal the deal until this bozo interrupts them. Grant the Lady Ash her I accession to the- This is something you might reconsider. This guy's accent is all over the place. I'm assuming it's supposed to be like Russian or something, but why does he have a Russian accent? Russia does not exist in this world. We are in a completely fictional world, yet this guy just walks in with like some half Russian, Italian. I don't know, he's all over Europe. I don't know what he's supposed to be, but it's very jarring and confusing. I am but one of very, very many. Try as I might, I could not stop these war alone. Thus, I came seeking Lars's assistance. I wish he took off his shades and had another pair of shades underneath. That would have been epic. There's something kind of humorous about his character, I will admit. This game starts to throw a bunch of characters at you towards the end of the game, and it's hard for you to attach to them because we've already gotten to know the main cast, and then the story is like getting towards the end of wrapping up, and they just keep throwing these random ass characters at you, like this dude. Like, I feel like this guy did not need to exist. He could have not been in this story at all, and the main bulk of the plot would not have changed, but. 
hey ho, he is here, and he's here for like two more scenes, and then we never really hear of him ever again, so uh, enjoy him while he's here, I suppose. The Emperor Grammys is no more. His life was taken. Father. Oh, that's it? So yes, that very underwhelming reaction from Larsa is correct, and the king of the empire is dead. Dun dun dun, which means that obviously Vayne has now taken position as the leader of Arcadia, and we get this cool little scene here where Gabranf is given an ultimatum, where he has to choose whether to murder this other judge that is going against Vayne and has caused some problems, and this is now where Gabranf is making the choice that he is sticking with the Empire and going to follow Vane no matter what he tells him. But I like the progression we get of Gabranf's character. You can tell he isn't quite on the side of Arcadia. His main role is to protect Larsa, but he's given all these horrible other jobs that he needs to do. And you can see him kind of contemplating his morality with this. And it's very cool. I do like Gabranf's character. I wish we got a few more scenes with him because we don't get to see too much of the interaction between him and Bosch, simply because the two characters never really meet throughout the game until right at the end. But you can tell there is a good guy in Gabranf and that he is struggling to deal with the requests that are given to him and it makes him the perfect sort of anti-villain character that we all love to root for secretly. <gasps> Journey across the Paramana Rift to the still shrine of Miriam. So the next task is to go grab the Sword of Kings, which can cut through Nephesite, allowing us to destroy these powerful weapons. So we do that. We head over to the Stilt Shrine of Miriam Margulies. I started to cream in my knickers. I could, I could feel it. And this is another really cool dungeon. I love the dungeons in this game. They just have some really cool puzzles in them. You can see here we have this switch that when activated triggers these zombies to come out from under the ground. So we have to kill them, but luckily they are quite easy. I'm just using a party of Fran, Bosch and Ash at the moment, just because they need some levels and I just wanted to see what kind of enemies we'll be facing in this tomb and just decided to go with these straight away. But as you will soon see, every time I activate the switch, it just summons more zombies. And at first, I remember playing this as a kid and just being like, why does this keep happening? Why is it every single time I press this, these zombies come out and nothing changes? And it turns out if you read what the inscription says, it says the bearer of the Dawn Shard is the only one who can activate the switch or something along those lines. And luckily Ash can equip the Dawn Shard and activate it. So we switch over to Ash, who already has the Dawn Shard equipped on her and press the button and then BAM! The eyes in the back glow up there and suddenly some new doors have opened for us and we can continue with the rest of the dungeon, which is just very, very cool. It doesn't explicitly say it to you. It's kind of written in a riddle and I quite like that. It kind of forces you to think on your feet and be like, oh yeah, obviously this place would only be active to us if we had something like the Dawn Shard because it proves that we are part of the dynasty and are able to go and visit this tomb. This is probably the coolest of these dungeons that we visit. I think there's like three. You can see there the statues come to life and you have to defeat them. It's very, very awesome. But let's continue on now to this boss battle here against this, I don't even know what you can call this, this masked floating uh, totem pole thing with blade hands. It's quite creepy, but I don't really know what it is. It's very cool though. And this fight is quite interesting because it has this magnetic field. And what this magnetic field does is it means that people with heavy equipment cannot be used. Uh, they're just super, super slow. You can see their Balfir is just like, slow as anything and uh, his defenses are just not working at all uh, i don't really understand it but yeah can't use heavy armor in this fight but as you can see our party is mega mega powerful and we are dealing massive damage to him and he uses his big attack here which is quite cool he does like this slash but it really does not do too much damage to us at all but using a party of Pinello, bosch and fran at the moment and they're just whacking him with sticks and poles and maces until eventually he goes down and has one of the most dramatic deaths i think we've seen thus far not only does he die he decides to uh fall into a pit of lava as he screams for help as his uh, body decomposes and explodes. Yeah, very cool. But once the boss battle is over, we walk over to this chest, which gives us the sage's armlet or the sage ring even. 
And the Sage Ring is incredible because it halves our MP cost, which is a super, super handy accessory, which we use for the entirety of the game. I just wish we had three of them so that Bosch, Fran and Van could have them, but I give it to Bosch simply because we use Bosch the most and he casts the most spells using black and white magic. And I'm just looking for it on the license board and making sure I get that equipped on him as quickly as humanly possible. Okay, so we've got this puzzle here where it says that all of these statues need to be pointing towards the sword. And the sword is located in the south of this dungeon. So I make sure all of the statues are pointing towards the south and then I head back to where the sword is located and the gate has not opened. And it turns out it means it needs to face the sword that's in the center of the dungeon which is like quite obvious because there's a giant dude holding a sword in the middle of the dungeon but I for some reason thought it meant where the actual sword that you're trying to collect is located and it's just me being dumb trying to figure things out for myself and realizing I'm kind of stupid so I go back through the entire dungeon all over again rotate all of the statues back to the correct direction and then we can go back to this spot here and collect the sword uh, this this dungeon took a lot longer Longer than it needed to just because of my lack of intelligence getting in the way of my progression which is just classic me to be honest I could have just used my eyes and brain but I decided not to now you can see the sword has lifted and we are ready to collect our sword but of course things are never that simple right we have to actually go through another eidolon to get towards the sword and this is the ice eidolon which is named Mateus and this thing is awesome it's like a sexy lady goddess with a giant spear and I was like, okay, it's another story boss, it's going to be super easy, my characters are very over leveled and just really good at everything. So I went into this fight just thinking, I got this, this is going to be super easy. And uh, I get humbled real quick because it has these little blizzard monsters that are dealing damage to us. So we first need to get them out of the way. And straight away, people have been put to sleep, damage has been dealt, and I'm like, oh, okay, this is not just like an easy fight, I'm not just going to breeze through this like I did the last fight. I have to actually put in a little bit of work, I guess. Luckily, this queen is weak to thunder. Not quite sure how that works if she's the queen of ice. Why is electricity strong against ice? I don't really know. This goes against everything I've learned from Pokemon, but either way, we are using Fundara with Fran and Bosch to get the job done. And then we just have Ash there to absorb some of the damage. And she absorbed the damage so much that she died. And then Bosch dies soon after. And I'm like, oh crap, this is a really powerful fight. So I bring in my boy Vaughn instead of Ash so that we can do some extra healing. That way, Bosch can focus on dealing damage rather than having to heal up the characters and we can just leave that to Vaughn. And she is knocking us out quite quickly. You saw some of her damage did about 1,000 to us. So I'm like, oh God, this is a story boss. Why am I suddenly struggling so much? Am I not as powerful as I thought? Yes. I also had to go through the dungeon twice. So I must have picked up extra levels by doing that. But still, she's just dealing loads of damage. Luckily, she is also taking a lot of damage. And as long as we have a black mage alive dealing Fundara to her, then it should be able to get the job done quickly. And the big attack hasn't come out yet. So I'm feeling a little bit confident. But to be honest, I kind of thought, okay, I'm probably going to lose this fight and I'll just retry again. And, you know, come in more prepared and hopefully win the second time around. And the big attack comes out and I'm like, okay, I'm doomed. Most of my party is already dead already. She's summoning giant glacial ice blasts to come and destroy us. So I'm like, we ain't surviving that. And we don't, of course, we die. And I'm like, okay, that's like the majority of my party down. We are just down to Balfir. Can he get the job done by himself? Probably not. So I go ahead and use some Phoenix Downs to revive Bosch. And then I also get Pinello back up on her feet as well. Pinello has some good survivability and Bosch can heal us and deal some damage. So I figured this would be a nice party to come back to. And the big attack is now out of the way. So maybe she's tired after that and she'll just slow down and not hurt us as much. Uh, but either way, I kind of just assumed that I would die to this and I'm just going through some of Balfir's techniques to see what he can do and I go with bleed and I don't think it really works. So I'm like, okay, she hasn't got much health left. It's definitely doable. We just need to get a few more attacks in and then BAM! She dies. So that was definitely a close call but my party is still pretty strong. We, we are pretty weak defensively. 
But the offensive output is definitely there, and hey, it was enough to get the job done and earn us our second... Is it our second Eidolon? I think it's our second Eidolon. I go ahead and gambit the Eidolon to Balfir as it increases his max HP by 230, which is so good because it just means he can last a bit longer in fights and be a bit more defensive. The stone bleeds mist. It has been roused. Okay, we've aroused this rock, which is very interesting, and now it's time to destroy it. We have the sword, but of course the rock doesn't want to be destroyed, so it's doing everything it can to stay alive by showing Ash visions of her late husband, and I don't know if anybody has made this connection before. I see this game compared to Star Wars all the time, but this is literally Lord of the Rings. Like, <laughs> everything about this is Lord of the Rings. Instead of it being a ring, it's a shard, a dawn shard to be in fact. Everyone talks about how enticing the power of Nephesite can be, but the effects that it has on your mentality can be quite devastating. And it's exactly the same as Lord of the Rings. The person who possesses the ring goes crazy over the amount of power that they have and it starts to play tricks on them. I'm sure people in the comments will tell me that there's a Japanese sort of story similar to Lord of the Rings that inspired Lord of the Rings and that this game is likely taking influence from that rather than Lord of the Rings because that's what people said about Star Wars so I'm assuming there are other things that I don't know that play into it but the comparison is undeniable to me. What the ring symbolizes in Lord of the Rings is exactly what the Nephesite symbolizes in this game so I'm not mad at it. I like Lord of the Rings. I love Star Wars. So I'm happy to see these sorts of comparisons translated through Final Fantasy. But let me know what you guys think about it in the comments. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is it just me reading too much into it and the comparisons don't actually even exist? And while you're down in the comments, you might as well like the video and subscribe. And then once you've done all of those things, you can also send a tip using the thanks button on YouTube. And I will make sure to shout that out at the end of the next video. Or join as a member to get early access to my videos, as well as other lovely perks. But that is enough of the self-promotion. Let's get back to the story now. There it is again. Now we are seeing the effects of what Nephesite can have on a human's brain. And you can see he is possessed by this scary ghost dude who does give him superpowers and superhuman strength, but it also corrupts him and makes him go a little bit crazy. And we learn more about these creepy ghosts later on in the game, but for now we need to destroy this judge because he has just killed everybody in Mount Burt Omisace, including the dude who is going to turn us into a queen. What is it? Queen. And that's no good, so we need to sort out this judge immediately. And I'm a bit scared because he has the power of Nephesite on his hands. He's probably going to be quite difficult, or so I thought. And you can see it's just him on his own. Nope. And no, it's not because actually a bunch of guards come in. So that means we'll have to get rid of these small dudes first and I use Darkra just so that we can deal damage to multiple targets at once and I think that's the best course of action and instead of junctioning it I'm just going to keep going through and selecting Darkra each time and then going over to Fran and using some of her multi-target attacks such as Fyra and just do it that way because it's just much easier to fight against one dude than it is to fight against four so we'll just get the little dudes down and this guy's health bar is already a quarter of the way gone so I'm not too mad it's kind of a bit of a letdown you had all of this build up towards how powerful Nephesite can be and you know the power that it gives people when they have it and then you have this super easy fight and I say super easy Bosch does actually die but I still don't really feel much threat of danger because now the little guards are down it's just one against three and I don't think there's much he can really do to us. He's quite quick though. Whenever he attacks, he usually gets in like four hits, which like immediately KOs whoever he is going for. But hey, uh, for some reason Vaughn also is berserked. I can't really remember why that's the case, but he is and that's cool, I suppose. So I immediately switch Vaughn out because the only reason we need Vaughn is for healing and he can't seem to heal at the moment because of his berserk status. So it's going to just have to be a party of Balfir, Fran and Ash just constantly stabbing him in the face until he eventually goes down. His defenses are actually not too bad and as it gets towards the end of the fight here, he gets a little boost. But like I said, we are fine to be honest. And uh, yeah, I get a Phoenix down on Bosch right at the end, but I didn't really even need to do that. 
because he goes down very quickly to one more attack from Balfir, and that is Judge So-and-so down. I can't remember this guy's name, to be honest. We're just going to call him Judge So-and-so, and it's time for another awesome death. He's like, no, I've been defeated. Oh, the Nephocide is making me go crazy, and then, boof, he just explodes, and all of his juice goes everywhere, and, uh, yeah, that's that fight, I guess. My leave, I take. Not if anything to say about it. I have. I kept dying to this hunt here against this snake because he was just dealing too much damage to us. And I was actually on live at the time and you guys told me that if I go to the Giza Plains I can pick up the blind spell. And apparently this guy is super susceptible to blind and you have to wait 5 minutes for him to arrive so I'm just standing here staring at people's butts until eventually he does appear and straight away I get Fran to cast blind on him. And another cool thing about blind is that it lasts the entire battle. So as soon as you have blind on him, the blind will last the entire fight. So that's really, really cool because the main issue we were having with this fight was that he was just dealing lots of damage very quickly. And blind kind of just halves that. He does still manage to get a lot of hits out on us. So having blind doesn't completely make this fight useless. It still is a challenge nonetheless. He's also weak to slow, but it's just very hard for us to get slow out on him because of Balfir's terrible magic stat. But luckily, I believe one of our weapons has like slow touch on it anyway, so we can just get slow out that way. But I'm trying to just automatically cast slow over and over and over again so that we can get it out and having no luck. But that's okay. We still have the blind and the blind is good enough. And we're using a party of Balfir, Bosch and Pinello. Bosch is there to deal some damage and heal us. Pinello has some really good physical damage and can hit multiple times, which is always handy. Plus her big HP is good for absorbing damage. And then Balfir also has really good damage at this stage. You can see a critical hit does over a thousand damage and he gets critical hits out quite frequently because that's just what the long range weapons in this game do. And his health bar is now going down quite rapidly, which is very, very exciting because I had a lot of trouble with this guy the first time. I was like, we are way too underpowered for this. There's no way we can defeat him at this point. But thanks to you guys hopping on live with me and telling me to get blind, it just meant that this became a bit of a cakewalk. Well, I say cakewalk, it's still a challenge. And uh, getting to HP critical, he starts dealing more attacks much more quickly and his defense rises once again. And yeah, if you guys ever want to hop on live with me, I go live every Wednesday night at 9pm GMT, which is UK time. And we have a lot of fun there. I'm currently playing Final Fantasy XIV, but I might switch it up and play some other games for you guys. And it really helps me out because it means I don't have to read stuff online all the time. I can just ask you guys and you guys are just a plethora of information, which uh, it's very handy. It means that I can go through some of these challenges a bit easier and do some actual cool techniques. This guy is now down to his last little sliver of health, but he's just KOing us like nobody's business. Every time he does manage to get hits in, it deals a lot of damage. You can see it does like over a thousand damage. And for most of our characters, that's like a one hit KO. Luckily, Fran comes in and Aqua actually deals loads of damage. I probably should have been using her from the start, to be honest, but we managed to get him down after a few more attacks. And you guys also told me that I can pick up haste from the bunny village. So I go ahead and do that. And then I go and take on another hunt here, which was super easy. I won't even show you because it was just like way too underpowered for where we're at in this game. And then we go and take on this next fight against the super quick speed black chicken of death. Death to all of them. Oh, and this is like one of the worst fights in this entire game. It just runs around the screen way too fast and gives me a headache and causes us a lot of problems. The first stage of this fight isn't too bad. He does run around a lot, but you can just keep dishing out attacks and he doesn't really deal too much damage to us. We just have to run around this entire area like a maniac. But where this fight starts to pick up and become really challenging is towards the end. He just becomes immune to like all forms of damage. And the only thing you can do to attack him is use drain because he's immune to every single element and physical damage. And the only other magical damage we have that isn't elemental is Drain. And Drain isn't the most powerful of spells. And he also decides to chuck rocks at us 
at that point, which deals a lot of damage to us. And yeah, we also have to deal with all of the other enemies that are on screen here, such as this blizzard elemental thing, which causes silence on us and is very problematic. And it's like, dude, I'm just trying to kill the chicken. I don't have to run around dealing with things like this, but we have to take out the enemies around us so that the chicken becomes a bit easier. So we go ahead and do that and at this point I was quite tired, I was on live still and you guys were telling me how to do this fight and we're just not powerful enough to deal with this guy. We do get blind on him which is nice. But you're about to see in a second he's going to start running around and we have to chase after him. Luckily Balfir has a long ranged weapon so he is able to actually hit him from afar and also our spells can hit him from afar. But it is just very frustrating, he does not sit still long enough for us to get him. And he's also immune to all of our magical spells because they're all elemental spells and he's just immune to them all, which is all very very frustrating. Like I said, Drain is the only thing that can actually hit him, but doesn't really deal enough damage to him. He also has very good dodge, you can see there he keeps parrying or blocking a lot of our hits, so it's just impossible to get anything out on him. Plus a lot of us are blind, plus there's these skeletons that keep getting in the way. This fight is probably my least favorite favourite of all the fights in this game thus far. It's very very frustrating. I'm gonna fast forward it towards the end of the fight because we run around for ages but he does eventually stop when he gets to HP critical and this is where he ups the ante and things start to get more challenging. So now you can see our physical attacks are doing nothing. He is actually immune so I'm just going through and testing out which abilities I can use. Dark seems to heal him. Physical attacks aren't doing anything. Every other elemental attack seems to just heal him up. So this is where I was asking chat what they thought and they told me to start using Drain. So I do go ahead and do that. But as you can see, when he throws a rock at us, it does over 2000 damage. So there is no way any of our characters are surviving that. Pinello is the only character with 3000 HP and even then she can survive one of them and then she's down. And he's very quick, so he uses it quite a lot. And you can see also Drain is not doing very much damage to him either. So even though his health bar is very little, it's still proving to be quite challenging. And as you can also see, he's decided to go run around again. And every time he comes back, he throws a boulder at us and kills us. So it's just like non-stop going through the menus, trying to use Drain, using Phoenix Downs. And this fight just took way too long. I've cut this up quite a lot just because it dragged on for way longer than it needed to. And most of this fight was just me in the menu trying to sort things out. But we're down to our last character. It is none other than Bosch, my favourite dude. But even he can't withstand the chicken's mighty peck and we go down. Oh no we don't actually, we have one more. We have Ash. And she has a spear that deals lightning damage so the chicken is immune so... I kind of just let him kill her at this point. I was like, what is the point in trying to revive anyone? We clearly need to come back to this fight at a later point. I stupidly decided to give the fight one more go just in case there was something I was doing wrong the first time around and there wasn't, he does kill us again. So I move on to this next hunt here which is against this bunny in the Golmore jungle and it's quite annoying because it runs around for ages but the guys in chat helped me out again and they told me if I throw a berserk item at this guy, the something wine, I can't remember what the item's called, but it inflicts berserk on the enemy and if we do that it stops running around and just decides to attack us constantly and its attacks are very weak so giving it berserk is actually incredibly handy. It's slow and berserked, it can't heal itself, it can't run away, all it can do is deal physical damage to us which is doing like 200 a pop so I ain't too scared of this guy at all. It took me a while to realise I could do that and I was running around the jungle for a while but as soon as we had that figured out the fight was easy as anything. So this guy goes down pretty darn easily. I told you we were going hunt crazy on this episode and this is no exception. We have this spooky demon dude and he is incredibly weak. We are way too powerful to be doing this fight at the moment. But hey, I didn't have a chance to do it earlier so I'm doing it now. And there's not much to talk about with this one. It is as simple as hit the enemy several times until he dies. So we do just that. And then the next fight is also in this mine which is quite handy. So I head there straight after this fight. And this is probably my favourite hunt that I've done thus far. And it's really fun just because it does something different to us. He has faith on him which increases his magic so we do need to use Dispel as quickly as possible. But he causes stop on all of our party members so I kind of just freeze and wait for it to finish but 
Uh, that was taking too long, so I was like, I can send out Bosch because Bosch has Dispel, and I left Varn in so that the stock could wear off eventually. And he doesn't deal too much damage to us, but that Faith is definitely quite a scary status to have on him. And Stop is one of the lesser used status effects in this game, so it's quite cool that this guy utilizes this. I also really like his design, like he just looks like a cool little wizard dude. He's floating around and looks really powerful. And it's not one of those fights where there's loads of enemies around that get involved and just annoy you. It's just you and the spooky dude. Spooky! And you're just having a battle, which just feels nice. And his health bar isn't massive, it's not tiny, it just feels like we're at the right level to fight a fight like this. And just when I thought this was going to be another super easy fight, he decides to restore his HP all the way back up to full again. So we have to do the fight again. And he also casts every single positive status effect under the sun on himself. He's got Protect, Shelve, Bravery, Faith, all of it. Uh, which is quite frustrating. Luckily one of our weapons has a slow touch on it, so he does get slowed quite quickly, which is lovely. And maybe I didn't see that he cast all of those things on himself, because I'm not using Dispel. And if I did use Dispel, the slow would wear off of him, but I think it's worth it to get rid of Protect and all of that. Uh, I'm sure I do notice eventually, but for now I'm just focusing on trying to heal up our characters. He seems to just be obsessed with Balfir. Me too! The f like he's just constantly using Drain on Balfir and nobody else. Luckily Balfir's defences are pretty good, but I would much rather him attack one of our other party members, but that's okay. He will eventually switch and hit someone else, I'm sure. And now I believe I have noticed that he has all of these effects on him. So I go ahead and use Dispel, which is very handy. Now we can actually start doing some good damage and he can stop dishing as much damage to us. Balfir and him just keep using Drain on each other constantly. So they're just replenishing each other's HP and swapping HP constantly. And that is what is causing this fight to be a little bit longer than it should be, is that not only does he replenish his health when he gets to HP critical, but as the fight continues, he's using Drain on all of us to get even more health. So we need to be out damaging his healing potential. And we are getting there slowly but surely. It definitely ramps up in difficulty after the first wave, but he does cast things like Reverse on us, which is quite interesting, and Vandara, which deals a lot of damage. And it's just nice. It's just like nice to have an enemy that does lots of stuff. And I felt like this was like a very good challenge that wasn't like really overly challenging, but still challenging enough to be interesting. So I've got a party now of Balfir, Bosch and Pinello, and I'm just trying to dish out the hurt now. Balfir has those shots that can cause slow, which is very handy. He's also got good defenses. He's got some good tech and he also deals a lot of damage. Pinello is just there as a big meat stick. She is just whacking him with her stick and dealing damage. She can't really do much else. And I think that's why I don't really like the Ulan and the Monk in this run is because all they can do is dish damage. They don't have any extra utility. It makes them quite boring. Whereas the other characters, all of our mages have like damage that they can do, but also a little bit of extra substance to them as well. And our hits aren't doing nearly enough damage compared to what he is healing. And we're getting him right down very, very far to the end of his HP. And it's just taking a little bit longer than it should because of his drain dealing so much more. But luckily he's going for Blizzara now, which is dealing a lot of damage, but it isn't enough damage to take us all out. And we get him down without too much of an issue. And I loved that fight, that was awesome. So we go ahead back to Jahara and collect our rewards and we get this cool armor which I give to Bosch which gives him loads of magic defense which is incredible. And I think I'm gonna leave the episode here for now. We got a lot of hunts done in this episode which is awesome and then we are ready to continue on with the main story quest in the next episode. But for now I'm going to give a quick shout out to Sluggy95 for the tip on the last episode. Thank you so much for watching. My name has been Jamsack. See you guys next time.